الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. So continuing our session today is a fourth session. We had stopped in the question number twenty one. which is the most important and most greatest thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited every human being from committing it. Just having a short recap for the important things we took yesterday is the Tawheed of Asma wa Sifat. Tawheed, I said it is split into three parts for making it easy for the people to understand, becoming generations to understand. So here there's a point we have to note in the Tawheed of Asma wa Sifat. It is that in Arabic language, in the culture of Arabs, in the culture of Arabs, it is that when a person's or a thing's importance increases, the number of names for it also increase. The more, for example, this is a pen, and now the importance of the pen increases okay they have more importance for this in the arab culture so they give more names to it so for example you can see the word sword we all know safe for the sword we all know safe but there's also another word hind and there are many other words hind so there are many words like when you see there are 500 words for sword for just one sword, there are 500 words, 500 different names. So this is how Arabs, you know, the more the importance of a thing, the more the numbers. So similarly, Imam Al-Qurtubi, rahimahullah ta'ala, Imam Al-Qurtubi, one of the greatest scholars of Muslim Ummah, Imam Al-Qurtubi, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said that anything, the more the significance or the importance of it is, the more the numbers and attributes are given to it. So by this we can understand why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has 99 names and attributes. It is not 99, there are more than 99, but what we know by what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned in the Quran and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has mentioned in the ahadith, there are 99 names, but there are more than that which have been kept with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As you know, in one of the du'as mentioned, one of the du'a mentioned in Hasan Muslim, I was that I seek, you know, help from you and your assistance from all those names which I know and all those things which you have kept with yourself. So by this we understand that there are more than 99 names, but 99 are what we know. So I think the point is clear that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the people might have this, this doubt. That why is it that it is one supreme power and it has so many names? So many names is by this culture of Arabs that the more the importance, the more the number and attributes are given to it. Similarly, you can see Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his name is Muhammad, his name is Ahmad, and there are many other names Rasulullah himself has said in the hadith. So why? Because Rasulullah's importance is something significant. And then Quran also has many names and attributes. Why? Because Quran is also of that supreme power. So Quran is also important and it has its own significance. Similarly, the Day of Judgment. The Day of Judgment also has multiple names. You can see when you read the Quran, you come to know many different names of the Day of Judgment. Why? Because Day of Judgment is also a very important day where the truth and the falsehood is going to be separated and all the people are going to be accounted for what they had done in this world. So this was one of the short recaps. And then question number 20. Does anyone have any doubt, anything for what I have just said? Okay, question number 20. I had discussed some of the examples of ibadah. So any action here, you have to know that ibadah, the acts of worship are not, you know, acts of worship are not limited. They are unlimited and all the acts depend on the intention. If you change your intention, then that act of worship, which you think is normal also can become, uh, that act which you think is normal also can become an act of worship. For example, you drink water. 
So now drinking water is something, you know, permissible and it's not something an act of worship. But now you change your intention. In the hadith, this is the hadith. So Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala began sahih, sahih al-Muslim with this hadith. Innam al-A'malu bin niyad, the wording differs. But the meaning is same that Innam al-A'malu bin niyad, actions are based upon intentions. So you change your intention, then that normal act can also become an act of worship. For example, you drink this water, it's a normal act. But now you drink the water that, okay, now I drink water, I'll you know, quench my thirst. And then I can go and pray back. You know, I can go and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more. So now you are having that intention that you're going to drink this glass of water. You get more energy to drink and to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this also converts to an act of worship. So everything is based on your intentions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, You pray to me, you make dua to me, and I'm going to accept. Allah tells, there's nothing called I'm supreme, and then you cannot connect to me directly. Connect to me directly, there's no problem with it. You can call to me directly. Any doubt before we begin today's session? Any doubts before we begin today's session? Okay. So, The note shall be provided, inshallah, soon to the admin. Question number 22, we are preparing the notes. I am preparing personally. And inshallah, you shall be getting it soon. I cannot promise when, but maybe during the sessions or maybe after the book gets over or the sessions get over, maybe, you know, I'll get free time and then I'll prepare for it. I'll, I'll work on it. Okay, so question number 22, beginning today's session with question number 22. Shirk has two different parts and two different types of shirk. Shirk is split in two different types. There is something called Shirk al Akbar, the greater shirk, and Shirk al Asghar, the lesser shirk, the smaller shirk. So, what's the difference between both the greater shirk and the lesser shirk, the smaller shirk? What is the difference between both? The difference is that Shirk al Akbar, the greater shirk, it is that to, you know, bring some partners to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the worship, okay? You associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in worshipping. The, the acts of ibadah which we mentioned yesterday, the acts of worship we mentioned yesterday, like dua, like having an, taking an oath, like swearing or like swearing someone uh, other than Allah and then sacrificing to someone other than Allah and then uh, you know, tawakkul, having trust on someone other than Allah. You do all these acts, you do all these acts to, to someone else. You go and make dua to someone else, and then you say him to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or something. This is shirkul akbar. Okay, am I clear with the definition of shirkul akbar? Am I clear with the definition of shirkul akbar? The great shirk. Okay, so this is the shirk that the moment you come at it, you are going to get out of Islam. This is the shirk. It is so, so dangerous and so brave that, you know, the moment you come at it, you are out of the circle of Islam, the boundaries of Islam. Because I had said yesterday, how can you accept it logically when you invent a pen or a mobile phone and then someone gets the credit for it? You are not going to accept it naturally. So how do you think the one who created you, who is, you know, taking care of everything, of your affairs and he's taking care of your protection, he's, he's your sustainer, and then you go and pray to someone else other than Allah. How do you think can he, you know, have that, okay? Uh, he, he can accept it. So the moment you do it, you go worship to an idol, you go seek refuge from a grave, from a dead person, you go prostrate to someone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All these are especially for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You should show your humbleness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You should submit yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the reason that the moment you commit it, you are going to get out of the circle, the boundaries of Islam. 
Okay, and this is the same shirk Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Nisa, verse number 48. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna Allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bih. Wa yaghfiru ma duna dhalika liman yasha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not gonna, not gonna forgive shirk. Not gonna forgive anyone who associates partners with him. And he's gonna forgive everything apart from this. So now you can understand why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so strict in saying this. I have given an, uh, a logical idea, a logical idea to why is Allah is uh, why is Allah so strict in saying this that He's not going to forgive. And then now a question arises, which I have discussed yesterday, but let me discuss today also. That now we say Allah Rahim, Allah is the most forgiving, the most merciful, and many things. Then how do we say that, uh, how can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in the Quran that he's not going to forgive? You know, when you repent, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to forgive you. Then how do you think is Allah not going to forgive you? Is it, you know, contradicting or do you think it is confusing or something? I had discussed this yesterday also, but just let me wait for you people to participate in this because it's not just one way it's two way but you know when i stop you can begin because otherwise you know i can get confused because we have something to cover how do you think allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he says he's the most merciful then how is he gonna and, and then he says he's most forgiving most merciful then how do you think he also says he's under his own gonna forgive shit? Okay, so here there's something I would like to say that the revelation is of two types. I have said in the beginning, it is the Quran and Hadith. Hadith is not something which Rasulullah said by his own, but instead it is something revealed to him. And Rasulullah, as Allah says in Surah Al Najm, that Allah, Rasulullah does not say anything by his own. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala says in Surah Al Najm. He does not speak something by his own desires. So this is how Sunnah is also, the Ahadith are also part of Quran in three methods. In three ways, Ahadith are part of Quran. The first is, Quran says something, Hadith also repeats it. Okay, for example, uh, for example, Quran says, Aqeemu salah wa atu zakah that Quran says to offer your prayers and give charity, give zakah. Hadith, in hadith also you can say, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, Bunya al-Islamu ala khamsin shahadati an la ilaha illa Allah wa anna Muhammad al-Rasulullah wa iqam al-salah wa ita is zakah. Same thing is repeated. Different words with the same meaning. This is the first type of how a hadith are part of Quran. The second is, Quran says something, a hadith, explain how we should act on it okay and this has some details but i'll just give it the main idea quran says something and ahadith go into detail about that like for example quran says salah. quran says offer prayer ahadith say you ahadith say you, say you how we should offer these prayers as rasulullah says in the ahadith ila salati in one of the ahadith rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam described how you should pray that when you stand for the prayer you should you know say allah okay and then also in another in another hadith rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says sallu kama ra'aytumuni usalli pray as as how you have seen me praying so this is the second way how hadith are part part of quran and how they explain the quran okay the first thing is it repeats the second is it explains and this and the third is a hadith see a complete new ruling which is what which was not mentioned in the Quran. A hadith, this is the third type of how a hadith are part of Quran and part of revelation that was revealed to Rasulullah, that they see a completely new command which was not mentioned in the Quran. For example, gold is not allowed for men, silver is not allowed for men, silk is not allowed for men, they are allowed for the women of Muslims of the Muslim Ummah. So 
Can you find anywhere in the Quran that gold or silver or silk is not allowed? No. But then how do you say it is not allowed for the men? It is because as Allah himself says in the Quran, Rasulullah does not say anything by his own. Rasulullah says something which we have revealed. He does not say anything by his own desires. He says something which will reveal upon him. So this is how I have discussed that, you know, Quran says something in Hadith also explained. And this is how Allah says in the Quran that Allah, Allah does not forgive anyone who associate partners with him. But Hadith come and explain how it is that Allah will not forgive is in one of the hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that the person who dies without associating dies, note down the keyword dies, the person who die who dies without associating partners with Allah shall enter Jannah. The first part of the hadith is the person who dies without associating partners with Allah shall enter Jannah. The second is, second part is and the person and the person who dies associating partners with him in the condition that is associating partners with him shall enter hellfire so this is how it is explained that the person who is going to die without repenting without going tawbah to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shall you know enter and enter the hellfire and then also allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in surah al-zumar verse number 53 allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مَنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ Say to those servants of mine who have transgressed, who have oppressed themselves, to know that Allah is the most forgiving. قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مَنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ Do not despair. Do not despair from the, from the mercy of Allah. لَا تَقْنَطُوا مَنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا Allah is going to forgive all the sins. No matter which sin it is, he's going to forgive if you have fulfilled the conditions of Tawbah. If you have fulfilled all the conditions, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to forgive you if you repent before you die. This is how we have finished today's first question, which is the 22nd question, question number 22 in the book. Of the part one of this question, Shirkul Akbar. Then what is Shirkul Asla? What is the smaller shirk? The smaller shirk is something which is associating partners with Allah, but it is not going to take you, it is not so dangerous that it's not going to take you out of the boundary of Islam. For example, you swear, you swear, other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you swear, I will not say that. I'm not going to give you an example because it's not you know, appropriate, but you should understand swearing by someone other than Allah, you say, Wallahi, I swear by Allah. Now here you say something like, I swear by someone, other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not that grave that you are going to be out of Islam, but it's still a shirk, a smaller shirk. Okay? And it also leads you, it also leads you to the greater shirk, and you can get out of the um, boundary of Islam. And this is one of the examples, and Rasulullah has prohibited from this, saying in one of the, uh, one of the hadith, La tahnifu illa billah. Do not swear by someone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then showing off. In an act of worship, you are praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now you have offered prayer in the masjid. Now, for example, your sheikh enters. Now you see, okay, my sheikh has entered. Now I should show him, I should show him that, you know, I worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm a serious worshiper. So now you elongate your prayer, you lengthen your prayers and your core, your sujood, and you try to beautify it. Are you beautifying for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or for your shaykh who is entering? You are beautifying it for your shaykh. So here you are associating your shaykh in the worship of Allah, not by worshiping your shaykh, but by, you know, beautifying the prayer with the intention of showing your shaykh. So this is a riya, and this is showing off in the act of worship, showing, showing off. It's not worshipping your shaykh, but it is just showing off. So this is shirk will asbar, this is the lesser shirk, which by committing which you are not going to get out of Islam, but still it is not allowed. And it's the means for you to reach the greater shirk. Question number two is done. 
what are the two types of circle alpha and circle alpha anatomy and then beginning the a bit new thing like big details can i go forward if you don't have any doubts can i proceed okay let's see. i'm gonna give you time in the end and if i don't give you time you can contact the admin and that how that is the way you can you know get in touch with me and i'll answer your questions Question number 23 is, who are the first people who committed shirk? Who are the first people who committed shirk? Who are the first people who committed shirk? It is the people of Nuh alayhi salatu wassalam. Nuh, the first messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is the people of the nation of Nuh alayhi salam who committed the first shirk. And how many years later did they commit shirk but after adam alayhi salam adam alayhi salam after adam alayhi salam for 10 centuries which is thousand thousand years for 10 centuries for thousand years the whole you know all the people were on tawhid on the oneness of allah without associating partners with him but then there's a good story i'm going to mention it it's in the quran i'm going to say that Okay, so this is the reason actually why people of the nation of Nuh alayhi salam committed shirk. So what happened was Nuh alayhi salam, he was sent later on. These people, thousand years later, later there were five people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Nuh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Nuh, verse number 23, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَالُوا لَا تَدَعُنَّ آلِهَتَكُمْ وَلَا تَدَعُنَّ وَدَّ وَلَا سُوَاعَ وَلَا يَغُوثَ وَيَعُوقَ وَنَسْرَ وَدْ سُوَاعَ يَغُوثَ يَعُوقَ نَسْرَ Five people. So these were the five most religious, pious people in the time of, in the people of Nuh alayhi salam, in the people of the nation Nuh alayhi salam was spent. It was not happening during the time of Nuh. It happened in the nation where Nuh alayhi salam was sent. So what happened was these five pious people, what Suwa, Yahuz, Yahu, Wanas, these five people, when they passed away, Shaitan came to their generations, their people, and said these were really pious people and they were like, you know, very close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They used to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now we should not forget uh, forget them. So in days of, of matter, you cannot forget them is by creating their statues and keeping it in important places where you gather. That's how you can remember them, and that's how you can remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That these people remember Allah, they were close to Allah. So you know you remember those great people, you cannot forget those great people. So people you know used to keep their statues and remember them oftenly. Then what happened after this generation passed away? When the next generation came, Shaitan came to them and said, you know, these statues, your forefathers used to worship. And how are you not going to worship Worship them? So now they said, when our fathers worship, so we should also worship it. And that's how Shirk began. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Nuh alayhi salam to guide his community, to guide these people to oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala once again, which happened 10 centuries, thousand years later, after Adam alayhi salam, Adam alayhi salam. Okay, so this is how we can understand why the people of Nuh alayhi salam got into the act of shirk, which is question number 24. How the people of Nuh alayhi salam, the community where Nuh alayhi salam was sent, how did they fall into shirk? It is because of their exaggeration of the pious. Exaggeration, right? How can we forget them or we should create the statues and etc. They are the pious people, remember them. You don't need to create statues. So, so you know, exaggeration in their status, in their fame, and in their, you know, positions. This is how, with the, you know, reason of exaggeration, they fell into shirk later on. Now, what question number 20, now, this is how I finished my question number 24. Question number 25. What is the meaning of exaggeration? What is the meaning of exaggeration? The, the meaning of exaggeration, I have just said that you 
you know, exaggerate, meaning you're really thin above the level. Now he's a pious person. Okay. We don't need to rise and raise him above his level. We don't need to elevate his level. He's a pious person, leave him. Okay, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says um, in Surah An-Nisa, verse number 171, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ahl al kitab la taghlu fi dinikum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibits from exaggeration because you know the danger of exaggeration of the pious people, the level of the pious people, the status of the pious people. What's going to happen? What's going to happen when, you know, the exaggeration happens is you're going to fall into shirk. Like how the community where Nuh alayhi salam was sent. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Nisa, verse number seven, 171, 171, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ahl al-kitab, O the people of the book, la taghlu fi dinikum. Do not, do not exaggerate in your religion. Because exaggerating can lead you to shirk. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in uh, one of the ahadith which is narrated in Sahih al-Bukhari لا تطروني كما أطرت النصارى عيسى بن مريم إنما أنا عبد الله إنما أنا عبد فقولوا عبد الله ورسوله We don't need to remember the Arabic part I'm just mentioning it Okay, but you can remember if we, you can remember the sources It is in Sahih al-Bukhari Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says says do not elevate me do not increase me you know in my status like how the christians did like how the christians did to isa ibn Maryam, how the christians did to isa uh, alayhi salam the son of Maryam. you know they exaggerated him in his level and his status until they made him the god the son of god or whatever it is which is the actual worship so Rasulullah is prohibiting from his community to fall in. So what was the reason, question number 25 is what was the reason, what is the meaning of um, exaggerating in the level of the pious people? I have just explained it. And then there are some, you know, problems which I would like to discuss, you know, in ship. Um, question number 26 is what is the ruling of praying to a dead person? What is the ruling of you or of a person praying to a dead person? What is the ruling? Question number 26. A dead person cannot listen to you, nor can, you know, uh, he can reply to you. I mean, he's dead. He cannot listen to you. He cannot listen to you and he's not capable of helping you or doing anything or, you know, removing or, you know, uh, or, you know helping you out of a problem you have fallen into. That is question number 26, okay? So what is the meaning or what is the ruling of, of a person praying to a dead person? Of a person going and calling, making dua to a dead person? So this is one of the types, you know, just write it down, note down. You know, what are going to come now? All the questions are going to be question number, you know, question number 26 onwards, few questions until I end today's session are types of shirkul akbar so note down the types of shirkul akbar the first is what is the ruling of calling to that person praying to that person which is one of the types of shirkul akbar so what happens when you call him you get out of the boundary of islam allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in surah al-minun verse number 117 allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in surah al-minun verse number 117 and that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that those who call to someone other, those who pray to someone other than Allah, they don't have any logical proof for it. They don't have any valid proof for it. Okay. I have finished my point. question number 26 before one of the types of shirkul akbar. Question number 27. Now here just, you know, be careful. You know, we are going to take something of Tawheed al uluhiyyah Tawheed of worship. That why did the idolaters of Mecca were not able to accept, you know, connecting to the supreme power to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly? Question number 27 is that a person that does a person requires a means to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Question number 27. 
okay so now the idolaters of Mecca fell into a confusion that he is supreme power how can he is supreme creator uh, sustainer how can we connect to him so this was the reason of the confusion that they fell into shirk but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they also clearly said right I had just mentioned in Surah the Zumar they had said like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah the Zumar verse number three Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the words of Kuffar al Makkah, the idolaters of Makkah, they said, Ma na'buduhum illa liuqarribuna ila Allahi zulfa. We do not worship them except, we do not worship them except that they can make us more closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? So they have said the reason clearly, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, No, we don't need that. You can connect to me directly. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah al Baqarah, Verse number 186, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Rasulullah that if the servants, if my servants ask you about me, then, then say to them that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is closer to you. How much close he is, as Allah say, says in Surah Qaf, وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبِّ الْوَرِيدِ We are more closer to a person than his jubilogian. Okay? So that much closer. One verse is explaining the another verse. Okay? So Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number 186, that when, O oh Muhammad sallam, when my servants ask about me, say to them that I'm more closer to them. I'm very close to them, how close it is, I have just mentioned. Uh, and then continuing the words of Surah Al-Baqarah, When a person calls me, I listen, I accept his prayer. I accept the prayer of a caller. Of a caller who's calling me, I accept his prayer. Okay? So question number 27, do we require a means to call out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? No, we don't require. Okay? This is also Shaykh al -Akbar. Then question number 28, do the dead people, dead people accept our prayers, our calls? Do the dead prayer, dead people accept our calls? No, they cannot. They cannot. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains that the weakness of the dead people, I mean, they don't have any power, but Allah is showing the people who call them logically that it's not possible like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in surah Fatir Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse number 14 Allah says in tadu'uhum la yasma'u du'a'akum when you call them they're not going to listen to your calls walau sami'u mastajabu lakum and even if they listen to you they're not going to reply to you they don't have that capability wa yawma al-qiyamati yakfuruna bishirikum and on the day of judgment they are going to deny about your association, about your calling to him, calling to them. They are going to deny it. Repeating the verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that it's impossible for the dead people to listen to you or to accept your prayers. And he's showing it logically. Even if you say that they listen to you, see how what's going to happen. When in la If you call them, they're not going to listen to you first. Even if they listen to you, they're not going to reply to you. On the day of judgment, they are going to deny this. Question number 29. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, no, question number 29 is To whom should we offer our sacrifices and to whom should we offer the prayers? Whom should we offer the sacrifices and the prayers? This also is for Allah because it is also a kind of worship. So if you do it for someone other than Allah, then it is shirk al one of the other types of shirk al -akbar. Allah says in Surah Kawthar, Inna a'atayna kal kawthar fa salli li rabbika wanha. The, the second verse of Surah, surah al Kawthar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and offer sacrifice to him alone. Question number 29 is done. And then my final question for today, question number 30, my time is getting over. What is the ruling for a person who prostrates to someone other than Allah and offers sacrifices to someone other than Allah? I had just told, 
it is one of the categories, one of the types of shirk al-akbar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-An'am, verse number 162 and 163, Allah says, قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِي وَمَحِيَّايَ وَمَمَاتِي لِلَّهِ Say that my prayers, my sacrifices, and my living and my death is all for Rabbul Alameen, for the Lord of the universe. La Sharika Lahu, he does not have any partners, and that is what I am ordered. And I am I'm the first of the Muslims of the believers. This is, these are the verses 162 and 163 of Surah Al Anna. One question more, question number 31. What is the ruling of swearing by someone other than Allah? For example, Rasulullah. He's a really great person, uh, Rasulullah, Prophet of Allah. So what do you mean? Like, what is the ruling? No, I have said swearing is, the part, is one of the types of shirk asqa, of the small shirk. You cannot swear by anyone other than Allah. Rasulullah himself has said, La tahlifu illa billah. Do not swear by other than Allah. Now, why do you want to swear by someone who's prohibiting you from swearing by him? Now Rasulullah says, don't swear by me. I mean, Rasulullah says, swear by just Allah's name. Don't swear by anyone except Allah. Why do you want to swear by Rasulullah now? He is himself prohibiting you from. And then Rasulullah says in another hadith, if anyone wants to swear, they'll swear by Allah or just keep quiet. In Sahih al-Bukhari, man kana halifan falbihlif billah, awli yasmut. Yasmut, quiet. Stay quiet. Question number 31 is done and I'm not going to go further because my time is over. And if you have any doubts, you can reach the admin and by that I will cure your doubts. And with this, today's session is getting towards its end. Jazakumullahu khayran. Wa sallallahu wa sallam. Wa barak ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. والحمد لله رب العالمين وجزاكم الله خيرا وبارك الله فيكم